Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is Tim Bradshaw. He's a former British Army intelligence officer and recruited and run foreign agents worldwide as a human intelligence officer. He's also the author of a great book, Because I Can. But before we get a chance to speak with Tim, it's the Leadership Hacker News. Leadership is about us everywhere. And I wanted to dive in to find some funny, innovative ways of us bringing some of those leadership lessons to life. So if ever you've watched the movie Star Wars or any of the Star Wars trilogy, you'll find loads of leadership lessons packed within there. Yoda is one of my favourites. He has this great saying that says, do or not do, there is no try. And I'm often using that light-hearted analogy with any of my coaching conversations. But a long time ago, in a galaxy far away, the leadership lessons were created amongst this epic series of films. So here's a few. It's been proven that being born with talent is not enough. As we all know, Luke Skywalker is born with a natural talent to be a Jedi. Yet when we watch the movies, we know that that was not a given. He had to work hard at that. We watch Luke come to grips with putting himself in challenging situations and homing in on that force. And there are traits of good leadership, but true leadership takes place, self-reflection and mentoring which we also saw through their relationship with Yoda. Adaptability is also a key leadership lesson throughout the Star Wars movies. All of those Star Wars movies demonstrate that life does not always go to plan. And if you are rigid in your plans and stuck in your ways, you're not going to win. From Han Solo adapting a broken hyperdrive by hiding by the rubbish chute instead of a surprise alliance along the way, if you're able to adapt and think quickly, you're able to lead a team through any surprises. We know it's okay to ask for help as leaders. Sometimes you can't get yourself out of a situation without calling on someone else. When Princess Leia was in a bind, she would always know the right people to call and ask for help without hesitation. Some good leaders need other good leaders to advise them on their journey. And the one thing that is really true across all of the movies, that chasing power is the path to the dark side. Leaders undeniably have power and authority, but leadership is much more than that. Once you begin to get attracted to power and to chase power, you're heading to the dark side. Good leadership is all about sharing power and authority and creating more leaders. It's about people with good ideas and evolving those good ideas so that everyone becomes more powerful. So the next time you hear yourself saying, I'll try, just think you've been yoded. Do or don't do, there is no try. Let's get into the show. Timothy Bradshaw is a special guest on today's show. He's a former British Army intelligence officer and graduate of the Royal Military Academy of Sandhurst. His work as a covert human intelligence officer and target acquisition patrol soldier saw him recruit and run foreign agents worldwide and influence the outcome of extremely sensitive and dangerous situations. Recently, Tim's been running missions to Ukraine, delivering really, really important aid. He's a keynote speaker, and he's also the author of the book, Because I Can. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much for having me on. Really looking forward to getting into the diverse world of of Timothy Bradshaw. And I remember from the first time that you met and how you described what you did in the army and in your work as an intelligence officer, I think I might have called you the the James Bond (laughs) of the time. I mean, that's very flattering. And and unfortunately, every time somebody says that, I cop so much flack off all of my friends. But um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take it, Steve. Yeah? I've been caught, I've definitely been called worse things. I think your response to me at the time, Tim, if I remember rightly, was you might have had the work of James Bond, but you certainly didn't have the dinner suits in the expense account. No, absolutely not. And I'm still waiting for the Aston Martin as well. But that, yeah, that's, that's it. Not- yeah. So tell us a little bit about you, Tim, your early backstory, and give our listeners a little bit of a spin through to how you've arrived to do what you do. Um, it's not that exciting, Steve, really, which I think is almost kind of the point. 
Um, you know, we talk about resilience and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and actually, I haven't done anything that essentially anybody else couldn't have done if they wanted to. Um, I, I did my A-levels. I finished school. I kind of looked at university alongside everybody else and realised that I was doing that really because that was kind of what everybody else did. Um, not really what my sort of passion was. And, and maybe there's a bit of a theme there that will continue. Um, so I was offered a place to go to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Um, I literally just turned 18 in the October and, and went in the, in the January. So was really very young. Um, and I quite often laugh when we, when, you know, we talk about leadership. My first ever job out of school was sort of leading 37 soldiers age 19 by the time I got to that point. Um, and frankly, probably wasn't very good at it. Um, who's, who's very good at their first ever job out of school, but, but I had a lot of training, a lot, and a lot of backup. So, um, so, so made the best I could really, but I've, I've kind of never really done anything else. So very much, uh, experience based career, I guess. Um, and I, and I did that and that was the kind of mid nineties and I went out to Germany. Um, ironically, it's really funny looking back now. I say funny, slightly tongue in cheek, but obviously we were very much kind of the end of the sort of cold war doctrine and everything we were looking at was very much based, you know, about sort of the Russian army coming across the Eastern German plains, uh, which with what's going on now, obviously out in Ukraine seems a, a little bit surreal to be honest. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, and, and I, and I sort of did that for a bit and it was, it was a bit of a lull really in activity, certainly for the sort of regular army at the time. Um, and then I pursued a career in, in training after I served out my, my commission um and subsequently once sort of Iraq and Afghanistan kicked off I, I looked to go back to the military I felt as though I had kind of unfinished business and hadn't finished serving yet um I've always had quite a strong desire to serve rightly or wrongly um so I decided to go back and a friend of mine um had said to me oh you should look at you know look at reserves and I said crack you're joking you know to me the TA sort of as was was dad's army and you know that's absolutely not the case anymore um so i went through a patrol selection course which is a, a particularly arduous sort of running over the hills big rucksacks um small teams very much becoming self-reliant self-sufficient relying on your teammates in small groups um as a build-up really to go towards um afghanistan and then i kind of thought to myself well if i'm going to do this i want to do something that um perhaps my interim years as a civilian bring something to the party rather than putting me behind the curve. So human intelligence is, is exactly that. It's about building relationships and influence. Um, and actually, you know, we always sort of joke, but if you're having to use the cars or the guns, you've kind of got it wrong, essentially. Um, it's absolutely about building relationships and influencing people. Um, so a bit of a sucker for punishment, really. I put myself through yet another gr grueling selection process. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a theme, isn't it, really? Um, uh, and we did that, and I, and I passed the course. And, and then what ensued was a fascinating few years um, working with some truly inspirational people on, on all sides of the divide, really. Um, some of those obviously worked for essentially terrorist organisations. Some of those were people that are absolutely keen to help their communities. Um, but, but the theme was always the same. It was always about relationships and influence, and I was doing some keynote speaking the other day and I sort of laughed and somebody said, how, how could you sum it up? And I was trying to think of a sort of corporate analogy. And I said, well, imagine trying to lead or influence somebody that not only do they not work for you, but in fact, they work for your biggest competitor. Um, and that was about the best I could, I could come up with, really. Obviously, trying to persuade somebody who has very strong views of their own that actually there might be a different way or a better path um and to give you essentially feed you in intelligence um so yeah so that's so that's what we did we did that for a few years which was truly fascinating um a couple of tours of afghanistan I, I did point out to somebody recently who um whose head went down a little bit talking about lockdown and i think i calculated that i have actually spent more time in afghanistan than i have in lockdown um well, yeah and i don't actually know if that's a good thing or a bad thing to be honest with you but it, but it is a fact um and then I think having left having left the military, uh, again, I have a very low boredom threshold, Steve, which I think is, is probably the theme. Um, but actually, for me, I've always been quite a big advocate of mental health. I've always struggled a little bit with sort of depression and anxiety. Um, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's, it's just the way my brain works, really. And, it, you know, it's a bit like a bank account in some of the respects you take out. So therefore, you have to you have to pay back in. Um, anyway, we decided a team was that we try and climb Mount Everest 
and shout from the highest point on earth that it was okay to, to ask for help. So we did. Um, we picked the wrong year. We did it in 2015, um, which those of you that are into mountaineering or, or the region will know was when all the sort of major earthquakes um, hit. So we found ourselves in the middle of one of the biggest natural disasters sort of ever to happen, certainly in that region, really. So again, it kind of turned on its head um, our whole outlook on, on what was going on and certainly tested our resilience in, in a very different way to the one we perhaps spent two years planning and training to do, um, which, which again, I think we talk about leadership on with Steve really today. And that's for me, that's one of the themes is it's that ability to flex, adapt and overcome actually, rather than when it's all going perfectly. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then having done that, we're, we, we've transitioned into doing this and we do all sorts of wacky stuff. And then we now run a company. And for me, it's about, can I share my lessons as accurately as possible? Um, we were joking, weren't we, Steve, just before we went live, that there's a lot of, sort of self-help stuff around, you know, and it's like, yeah, get a growth mindset, do this and do that. And you kind of think, yeah, I'll do that. How? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and that's really what the book was about. The book was a kind of user guide almost to dealing with some of these problems. So rather than a kind of conceptual, um, you, you, you know, big yourself up and feel better, it was, there, right, do this. When this happens, do this. Um, and I guess that then led, I was sitting on the sofa, we were watching what's happening in Ukraine, and my now wife looked at me and said, you could probably do something to help that, couldn't you? And I said, yes, I can. And she said, well, then you should. Um, so we put a team together, and we've now delivered um, three quite successful aid missions um, but I would think the point I'd like to make is that we've built a network of people inside Ukraine. So we've got live communications almost on a daily basis. So we know exactly what people need and what challenges that they're facing. And we are taking that aid um, specifically and delivering it directly to the people that need it. So we met, you, you'll appreciate we're not going to show their names here, but we shared directly. We drove out to Kiev, which is where we were last week. Um, and we met with these groups and we delivered, you know, hand delivered them exactly what they need. And fortunately, that's captured the imagination of a number of large corporate businesses um, that have really helped us out, actually. Right. Um, but I think that's because, again, it's not faceless, yeah. Stephen. I think that comes back to our theme of kind of leadership and and, uh, and relationships, right? It does, Tim. Yeah. And uh, an homage to you, genuinely. You know, one of the things I know about you, Tim, is that you see danger very differently to other people that I've you know, come into contact with, specifically in the business world. You, you almost see this as an opportunity. It's alluring for you. And I just wanted to, I wanted to unpack a little bit about that with you because it seems to me that you're almost attracted to that danger and ambiguity that comes with things like running an aid mission to Kiev. I think, I'm not sure if you're necessarily attracted to it, but I certainly see opportunity in it. So we often at the moment sort of VUCA is quite a big thing, right? But vulnerable, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And we can use all the analogies you want. But for me, there's always then opportunity because if everything is absolutely, you know, tickety boo and perfect and jogging along, then we often joke that that's the point that you need effective management rather than necessarily a effective leadership. And I think if you look at sport as an example, you know, if you look at rugby, in offence, you're trying to create a break in the back line, right? Uh, or if you see a break in the back line, then there's the gap that you need to get through. Um, for your uh, Canadian and American listeners, yeah, that's a real sport where you don't wear armour and helmets and stuff. You actually- <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a little bit of controversy in the mix there, too. <laughs> uh, but, but I understand that the theory is probably very much the same. Yeah. You know, you're looking for that break in the back line, right, to, to go through the gap. And, and, and I think that the same is true. I'm sure it's true in ice hockey. Um, but, but I think the same is true in business. Um, if everything is the same, then you're unlikely to either improve or get a different result. And for me, as an effective leader, really, you should be seeking out the change or the opportunity. But, of course, that's uncomfortable for people. So if you can create a toolkit that enables you to initially deal, I guess, with like the biological reaction to change and stress, um, and then see clearly and find the opportunity. So, yes, I mean, Steve, I do see it as an opportunity, but that's because if something's changing, then maybe we it's, it's, a, it's a chance to, to get in front. You know, if anyone watches a Formula One that was on at the weekend, the minute it rains, the teams down the back of the grid a little bit see an opportunity, don't they? Um, yeah. And it, it's the same theory. Absolutely, yeah. So in terms of your experience of diving into Ukraine recently, 
you talk about resilience in your work a lot. What have you noticed about the resilience of the people in some of those war torn areas you've met recently? Oh, I mean, Steve, it's for, it's phenomenal. Um, I was trying to describe this to somebody the other day. It, it's both harrowing and inspirational in the same breath. Um, you, you know, you're talking to people that some people have lost their whole homes, their families and everything else. But then those same people have a look in their eye and, and they are not taking a step backwards. They are refusing to take a backward step. Um, and that would be enough for me to want to support them, regardless of any benefit to the UK or anybody else anyway, because I just always think that that level of courage should be at least supported, if if not rewarded. Um, but again, you know, when we go into businesses and we talk about clear communication and perhaps more, imp- more importantly, a unifying purpose, you know, a focus and outcome that we're trying to achieve, um, then that's the ultimate outcome, isn't it? Right. When somebody invades your country, yeah. um, that, that or defense of your home or your family, I mean, that, that has to be the kind of ultimate unifying purpose, I would think. And I suspect, and you'll know this more than most, in war-torn situations, period, you find a deeper, more meaningful resilience than you'd ever have anticipated in the world of business. I mean, the things that we get stuck up and worried about and stressed about in our world of business pale into insignificance in those situations, don't they? Well, there's no way out, Steve, which is what I think is interesting, okay? So I remember right. I remember talking to somebody about uh, special operations, special duties, special forces selection processes, and the theme all over the world, different, you know, every country has its own variants, but the theme is always one the same. It's adapt and overcome and adapt and overcome. But but actually, if you talk to the selection teams, a lot of them will tell you that the biggest dropout rate is, in fact, not on the course. Uh, it's the day before because people get the jitters the day before they go because they, they are anticipating what's coming. Uh, and they have an option, so they don't turn up. They talk themselves out of it. Or, believe it or not, the vast majority of people that go through all these processes, they don't get failed. They what's called VW. They voluntarily withdraw. In other words, they quit because they have an option to quit. Right. Um, and I think when we work with businesses, there is always an option to quit. And I think when we – you know, implement something new, push ahead with, with a new process or a system or a change, whatever that might be, there's always the option to go back to where we were before or to opt out. And I think when the pressure comes on and when you get nervous, that kind of opt out to your comfort zone becomes uh, more alluring, right? Right, yeah. When somebody is is uh, it has invaded your country <laughs> and it's your home, you just don't have that option. So you have to keep marching forwards almost at all costs. Um, and, and that's why I think in these situations, you see such uh, awe-inspiring levels of sort of courage and resilience because the, the, the option to sort of take the easy route's gone, it's, it's been removed. So people dig really deep and they find whatever it is that's you know, within inside themselves. I love the whole notion of there is no get out there's no plan b philosophy and that forms mindset that we talked a little bit about earlier so there's an example where you can't teach that you have to experience it in order to shift and create the right set of mindsets but i do wonder if we apply that level of thinking can that impact on our mindset do you think yeah because i think once you've done it once or twice um and you've proven to yourself you can which is for me where the sort of title of the book came because i can then what happens is you kind of is you kind of build confidence and it's it's almost like any new skill you pick up, you know, whether that's a sport uh, or, or learning to drive or whatever, w- you go, well, I don't know if I can do that. And then you do it just once and you go, well, I can. And, and I always say to people, not enough people debrief the wins. You know, we're very quick to debrief the losses, but the problem is we, we still don't know what good looks like. Whereas actually, uh, I mean, I've, you know, I'm, I've, I've been a ski instructor and stuff like that in the past. It's a passion of mine. And if, you, if you're teaching somebody to ski – and they get it right, and you go, wow, that was amazing, do that again, that was excellent. They can repeat it, and they have the confidence and the courage almost um, to, to repeat it, if that makes sense. And I think that's super, super important. And then you can start to instill that mindset in somebody. So we have this expression that if you can, if you can reward the behaviours that you want to see again, then actually that's how you change – that is ultimately how you change um, a mindset. Hmm. And I think certainly in professional services businesses at the moment – we see a lot of 
we we have this impression that performance is this kind of perfect thing all the time and somebody does something 95% correct but we jump on the 5% that they got wrong and we you know we call them out on it and then we're surprised when that person doesn't come back to us for more feedback yeah so what was the inspiration for the book tim i think it was an idea i had in my head for ages uh, i'm certainly not academic in any way shape or form um and i just for me it was probably the furthest i've ever been outside of my comfort zone to be honest so I kind of started it and therefore had to finish it. And I just wanted to have a little bit of a user guide for people. Um, you know, you do seminars, you do keynote speaking, and, and you kind of hand out notes and PDFs, and it's all a bit old hat, isn't it? So I just thought, let's do something a bit different. So a lot of stuff I talk about is in the book, but in terms of a don't do that, do do this type of a way. So it's just, I guess, a bit of a sort of, I don't know, user guide. That was the idea. And the whole notion of because I can is that self-talk almost to say that anything is possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the whole thing, because I think sometimes you just have to remind yourself, I can do this. I can do this. You know, I've been through various selection processes that we've talked about before, up and down various big mountains. And on a number of occasions, I've found myself having to remind myself, like, you've got this, you can do this. And I think it's also, it's about finding ways to do something, finding ways to, to make something happen. Um, you know, we were talking in the past uh, about leadership and taking decisions under pressure and how does the military impact on that? And I don't think that the military necessarily guarantees somebody becomes a good leader, um, but it does guarantee that you become a kind of a good decision maker. Yeah. But the one thing that is really um, interesting when you work with the military is there is never any question that we're going to do anything other than achieve the task, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So the whole team is focused on achieving the aim. Um, and, and that's probably the biggest take out. And, that, and that's a theme that runs through the book is this is what we're going to do. So how do we make it happen? Accepting we're perhaps going to change course a couple of times and, you know, it might evolve a little bit. That's OK. But fundamentally, how do we make it happen? I'm pretty sure it was you in the past, Tim, actually, that, that taught me that in the military, the first thing you get to learn as a leader is you have to make a decision. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, because I think that's a really interesting frame of mind that, you know, when you're still in a relatively young leadership position or indeed you're running a global organization is that making the decision is key right so uh, yeah I, I think it wobbles it's really funny it's a great analogy right we've all done it imagine you're driving your car and you approach a big roundabout and i live quite near the, the a9 the Kia roundabout which is a, anybody's ever been anywhere near scotland will know because they've sat there for 40 minutes trying to get across it um and you approach a roundabout and the person in front of you kind of half goes, then stops, then goes to go, then stops. <laughs> yeah. And chaos ensues, right? Because you kind of go, then stop, and then you hit the brakes. Maybe some people, sometimes, believe it or not, it's the most common cause of accident, people hitting the back of each other. And, and what's caused all that chaos is indecision. Now, if that person was either waiting for a huge gap, it's frustrating, but you can see what they're going to do. So you work with it. If that person, I only swore then, says, I'm going for it anyway, drops a gear and goes for it, scary as that might be you can see what they're doing and you can react to it it's the indecision in the middle that causes the problem and certainly my experience at Sandhurst was you don't fail Sandhurst for making a wrong decision if you make a wrong decision you learn from it you evolve but you it's the indecision it's making no decision that will make you fail because when you have sort of this sort of wobbly indecisive that's when the wheels come off that's when morale drops that's when the good ideas club get together that, that that's when people start going off and doing their own thing in opposite directions. And we certainly, one of the biggest things I've learned across everything that I've done is in high pressure situations, particularly when you're working with educated people is you need to provide reassurance and then direction. And that direction is where, you know, the decision-making is, is part of giving that direction because you then get forward momentum. And to me, if you can gain forward momentum, then actually it all kind of everyone starts to move in that same direction together and sometimes it'll be quicker than others yeah. but, it, but essentially yeah. it does work now you'd have been faced with a bunch of challenges throughout your careers and i say careers because they've kind of whilst it is still one career there's been a number of different facets to what you do what's been your secret sauce to overcoming those challenges and, and turning it into a positive outcome i think sometimes firstly understanding that kind of all things must pass you, you know um at various situations throughout my life, I've I've made mistakes. I've been impetuous. I've done stuff. And I think, oh, why did I do that? And you think the world's kind of ending around you, but you, but you, as you get older, you kind of realise that actually, okay, it's a mistake. It's going to be okay. And it, and it kind of these things have a tendency to right themselves. 
somehow and, and you come out the other side of it. So I think, you know, accepting that you're going to make mistakes and get it wrong, take whatever lessons you can out of it, um, definitely sort of is, is super important. I think at the moment, particularly, we're quite vulnerable to people having huge opinions about things that they know very little about. Um, and I think that's largely down to the ability for kind of social media, for people to kind of take a swing at you, if you like, actually without, you know, people you've never even met, <laughs> um, essentially. And I yeah. think that can be quite that can be quite damaging. So I think accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes, focus on the bits you can control, uh, which is which is your own performance and the way you react to, to stuff, and take feedback from the people you trust, but don't worry too much about the kind of naysayers or the people that almost. I think we sometimes come across people, and I think it's a bit of a UK disease at the moment, where we almost want people to fail, and I think I find that a bit strange, but but you see it quite a lot. You do, yeah. Where do you think that comes from? Um, I don't know, really. I, I, I honestly, for me, that it's a sort of it's a bit of a complete anathema to me. That is really, I, I don't really understand it. But whether that's a kind of jealousy thing or whether that's just, um, I think it's very easy. I can't recite the whole poem off the top of my head, but it's it's uh, Roosevelt's poem, isn't it? Where he says, "It's the man in the fight." Um, you, you know, don't don't chastise those that try and fail. Um, and I think sometimes people just when we're outside a comfort zone or perhaps people are attempting something that somebody else hasn't wanted to try, they almost don't want them to succeed. And I just find, I personally find that a bit strange, but yeah, try to try to override it and get past it. Yeah. I think business is becoming more receptive to failure in the old world of what failure might have been. And most businesses that I certainly work with and know of recognize that it's part of success making those steps and pivoting to something else yeah no Steve I mean I, I yeah I actually agree with you and actually if you want to push the boundaries if you want to learn a new trick so to speak you're going to get it wrong a couple of times first right but but if you want to adapt and overcome and if you want to uh, grow process then by definition you've got to develop and change and if you're going to develop and change you're going to do stuff differently and sometimes that's not going to go quite to plan I, I think sort of accepting that and then also creating a structure within a business so that when that happens, we're supportive of each other. Um, yeah, we have this expression covering each other's blind spots. Yeah. You know, so actually we're supporting each other rather than kind of going, oh, my goodness me, look at that. Steve made a right mess of that. You, you know, we should be thinking to ourselves, actually, it was brilliant that Steve had a go at that. And actually that bit and that bit were quite successful. So if we take those two bits out, support Steve, make sure he's okay, and then let's build on those two elements of that that work really well. To me, that's much healthier. Super. Now, you mentioned a little earlier on you'd suffered with depression and anxiety in the past. Are you comfortable with going there, Tim? Yeah, I don't mind at all, Steve. I think it's important that we do talk about it. Thank you. So I, I know that this is a driving force for you now, and you use it as a force of good to push you into other activities. But I wondered if you might just share with our listeners a little bit about the journey you've been on and, and what some of your coping strategies are. Yeah, I mean... For me, it's um, it's interesting, right? So, so my brain works at speed, as you already know, um, rightly or wrongly, and I have an ability to latch onto something, to focus on that, to not necessarily see some of the boundaries that perhaps other people see, and to therefore drive towards achieving that, um, and that enables me to think very laterally to, to get to a location that we need to get to. Um, but that same way my head works, if you like, comes with a price, and the price is that occasionally I then latch to things that I don't need to latch to, or I over I overthink people's reactions, or I overthink the way people come back to me, which, which then causes me to go into a, we call it like a negative spiral, sort of catastrophic thinking spiral, um, which, which is not uncommon with other people. And I say to people, I don't suffer from it; I live with it. I don't particularly want curing if that is a thing um, because I am me and, and the the bits of that that make it very challenging and my, my wife's amazing at um, helping me also make me really good at other stuff. So hmm. to me, you kind of can't have one without the other. Yeah. Um, but what I've tried to do in 2018, we did a year of challenges, which was another terrible idea. Um, and we essentially did an endurance challenge a month every month for a year we did like a half iron man triathlon we climbed the matterhorn um 
amongst other things, I cycled with Heart to Tour, which is a terrible idea uh, for any people in your in your audience that are mammals, middle aged men in lycra, yeah. um, and, and who have push bikes worth more than their cars that they perhaps haven't told their other halves about. Um, you know, it's the ultimate challenge. You get to cycle, a, you get to cycle the mountain stages of the Tour de France. Um, and I was definitely not ready for it, not prepared for it. And it put me to a really dark place. But one of the reasons that we did all these challenges was almost a bit of an experiment on me for me to try and work out, you know, how do you get through these things and how do you cope with it and kind of consciously deal with it. And I think for me, it's about momentum. So the first thing we have this expression is in the book actually called fear, false expectation appearing real. And anybody that's ever suffered with a bit of depression or anxiety, one often leads to the other, will find that I have the, the clouds kind of roll in and you start to think, oh, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And, and Steve's thinking this of me. And if Steve's thinking that of me, then this is going to happen and then that's going to happen. But the reality of that is, although that feels quite real to me at the time, the reality is that's not real. It's a perception of what's going on around you. So what you have to do or what works for me, I would never tell anybody what they have to do. What's worked for me is focus on what's real. So almost list the facts yeah, and our company strap line is intelligence, not information. So list out the facts. If this is what's real. This is what I know. And what you'll find is, or I find, is that that starts to then sort of push the clouds back because now I'm dealing with the reality of a situation, not my perception of a situation. And once that started to happen, you start to gain a little bit of traction. And then I have this other expression, which is remember for your big goal. You know, why did I get out of bed this morning, essentially? Um, ignore the dangerous middle ground and get there by taking small steps. So in other words, uh, using the Atar the Tour as an example, two mountains in terms of two of the four we had to cycle up. Um, I was, you know, flat out, done, finished, couldn't couldn't do it. And But I reminded myself that I was doing it to, to, for mental health charities, so therefore I wasn't going to let them down. That was my big picture. Yeah. But on mountain two, if I tried to think about mountain three or mountain four, I would have talked myself out of it, if that makes sense. So actually what I did was then focus on the next aid station, the next peak, the immediate target in front of me, and we call it micro goal setting. Um, and at one point I could have told you how many lampposts <laughs> were up the final street to the final climb because I was literally going one lamppost at a time. Yeah. Um, but it's quite a good analogy. So when that starts to happen, you set yourself a micro goal. So it's like, okay, can I get this done? Yes, I can. Can I get to the next one of these? Yes, I can. And then gradually that builds momentum um, and, and it sort of starts to take you forwards. Um, and I hope that, you know, I hope anybody listening, if, it, if that helps just one person, it's not easy. Um, but for me, that's made quite a big difference. And the more times I do it, I now go into a little bit of a routine and I can find myself start to deal with that. Amazing insights. Love it. Thank you for sharing that, Tim. Really appreciate it. So this is where we get to turn the tables a little bit now. So you've been a army officer, you've led businesses, you now run a really successful consultancy business. So I want to tap into that leadership mind of yours. So I'm going to first off start by asking you to choose and pick amongst all of the lessons that you've collected on your journey and narrow those down to your top three. What would be your top three leadership hacks? Have a toolkit, not a process. We, everyone loves a process, right? Everyone except me. Um, Processes are designed to make sure you get the wing mirror on the car in the right place at the right time on a production line. They don't work with people. Um, and, I, and I'll argue that with everybody all day. So have a build a toolkit of skills and experiences. And in the same way that if you had a problem at home, you'd go to the toolkit and go select the right tool for the right job. Rather than blindly following a process, think to yourself which tool is going to work You know, for the job that that I'm trying to deliver. So that would be my first one would be have a toolkit, not a process. Nice. Um, the second one, as a leader, will be pull, not push. Um, somebody once said to me, always try and be a warrior, not a mercenary. <laughs> um, so, and by that, what I mean is try and – empathy is an interesting concept, but, but try and put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're trying to lead – and ask yourself, what is it they want out of life? What is it they want to achieve? Um, and, you know, the motto of Sandhurst is serve to lead. So, in other words, the leader serves the team, not the other way around. And I think at the moment we have a tendency to go, well, I've made it. I'm, I'm the partner. I'm the CEO. I'm whatever. 
the millions will now run around after me and doing my bidding. Whereas actually, if you can create a pool so that you have a, a, a company full of warriors rather than mercenaries that are working for a check, then to me, you, you will achieve far more. And certainly when crazy stuff happens, like the pandemic or whatever else, that team of warriors are much more likely to rally round and find a way out rather than um, sort of take, take, uh, simply take the, take the paycheck out, if, if that makes sense. Love it. And then I think, my final, I think my final one would be, of the three, would just be simply sort of um, don't stop and keep reevaluating all of the time. Keep reevaluating the situation. Um, I'm a massive believer in John Boyd. The, the new Top Gun film is out, right? So uh, I've got to say it's brilliant. Uh, I was very sceptical, but no, it was brilliant. Yeah, I'm with you. But what a lot of people don't realise is that uh, the, the actual place, Fire to Town and Miramar, uh, came about because a guy called John Boyd, uh, who's a colonel in the American Air Force, came up with OODA loop thinking, uh, which is observe, orientate, decide and act. And it goes around in a loop. So... In other words, what happens is you you gather intelligence, you interpret that intelligence, you take a decision, you carry out that action like your life depends upon it. But then what you do is you instantly start to observe the reaction, if you like, that you're that you've carried out, and is it working, and adjust accordingly. And what that does is it means rather than having this kind of linear decision making process where the outcome is the be all and end all. In fact, any decision is simply part of this kind of ever-rotating process where you're constantly adjusting the course. And the best analogy I can think of is sailing. You, you know, you, you don't kind of set the course, sail for 10 days and hope for the best, then check the compass again. Um, you, you know, you're constantly checking the compass and comp- constantly adjusting the course. And for me, that, that, that would be it. Great lesson. So that you are always adjusting. Yeah, I love that. I love that last one as well. Because the world isn't as linear as people think it is. People are not as linear. Processes and organizations are changing intraday. And having that ability to be fleet of foot is is really powerful, isn't it? Yeah, I totally agree with Steve, absolutely. And and, and we're proving that more and more. You know, we kind of did coronavirus and thought, right, that's done. And and then the Ukrainian thing happened. And there'll be another one. You know, when this is sorted, there will be another one. Um, Exactly. So next part of the show, Tim, we call it hack to attack. So this is a typically where something hasn't worked out as you'd intended. It might be something that's gone quite wrong, but you've actually taken that as an experience and it's now positive in your life and work. What would be your hack to attack? Uh, I think you've got to you've got to seek out the, the positive outcomes from anything you can find to take the lessons out of it. And, and I think, you know, using an analogy, and I guess this is not everybody can use it, but we can use the lessons that come out of it, whereas we spent two years trying to pull off the Everest expedition and we got it all sorted and we, and we got to the mountain and we thought, wow, this is it. We're going to do it. You know, we all joke sort of, but you know, book deal and TV show. Um, and then when, when all the earthquakes happened and everything else happened around you, I think the first thing that happens is you kind of feel quite sorry for yourself and you think, uh, this is outrageous. I put all this time and money and effort and now this has all gone wrong. And then you suddenly realize that the people around you have lost their homes and their families. So, Whilst you can't help the way you feel, it puts it into context, and you. And I think you have to accept that. And at the time, I kind of walked away feeling like a little bit like a failure, really, it, even though they were situations so far out of my control. It, it, you know, it's it's not even fathomable to think you could have controlled that situation. Um, but actually, now we use that experience to help school kids. So we've spoken to over seven and a half thousand school kids about what it's like when it doesn't quite go to plan, um, about how you adapt and overcome and about how you refocus and how you keep working the problem regardless of, of what's going on around you. So, in fact, that very negative situation, what was that, 2015, so the best part of 10 years later, now is providing a very positive input and outcome to, to schools as, as to how to overcome the challenges that they've faced over the last, over the last couple of years. So, I think, like I said, take out the positive lessons, you know, wherever you can. Yeah, definitely. And that that was an extreme example of where learning happens, but sometimes the evaluation of the learning is sometimes afterwards, right? Mm. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. 
So last part of the show, Tim, we get to do some time travel with you. You can bump into Tim at 21, probably just finishing or midway through Sandhurst, I suspect at the time. What would your advice to him be? Uh, I think when we take decision-making, or when I teach critical decision-making now, which I do a lot of with big corporates, uh, the first thing we tell people is take a tactical pause, which is just take a deep breath for a minute. Um, you, you know, when you've got an aeroplane, there's a reason why they tell you to put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, and I think it would be take your time, you, you know, just pause for a minute and respect the experience of those people around you um, and kind of let it happen a little bit. Let it come to you rather than necessarily instantly try and force every situation. So just take a minute, take in what's happening to you and have faith that whatever is, you know, is going to come to you at some point. Don't, don't necessarily sort of instantly try and force it. Very wise words indeed. So then, Tim, what's next for you? Um, so we are busy at the moment with um, keynote speaking, and we are currently talking to a company in a minute about kind of mindset development programs. I think um, we're really passionate at the minute. I think there's a huge opportunity at the minute for businesses to really reevaluate how they lead, how they make decisions, how they motivate their workforces, and, and make a change. And I think probably now, more than ever, there's a window for people to seize that opportunity and go, we're going to take the lessons out of this. The workforce is up for it. We're up for it. And, and let's see if we can make a difference. So we're quite keen to kind of be a, be a part of that wave. Um, and then the next mission, we're, we're planning our next trip to Ukraine. The um, boys and girls that we were talking to the other week have got a massive problem. They haven't got enough vehicles to bring casualties back from the front line to the hospitals um so we're talking to a few people at the moment we've set up a charity called the sandstone foundation and we are working to try to see if we can't get some four by old four by fours out to these guys to help them and um, bring back casualties so that's uh, the next project i guess awesome brilliant news and for those folk that are listening to this tim i'm pretty certain they're going to want to know how they can get a copy of because i can find out a little bit more about the work you do with sandstone communications where's the best place for us to send them uh, two things really. The book is on Amazon. Uh, just simply search either for me or for Because I Can uh, or Waterstones, I think, have it as well. Um, and the best way to find out or get in touch is via LinkedIn. Um, so Timothy Bradshaw on LinkedIn. And I would love to hear from anybody. I, I love learning. I love talking to people. And particularly, as I said, if you've got a lot of listeners across, you know, further afield, America and Canada and all over, I'm, I'm always fascinated to hear how what we think resonates elsewhere. So please, yeah, uh, drop me a line on LinkedIn and then uh, I'll always do my best to, to respond. We'll make sure those links are in our show notes as well, Tim. But um, I'm just delighted that we've managed to get you on our show. You're an incredibly inspirational guy. You've got such a lot of experience that we can learn from in lots of different parts of our lives and work. So, Tim, thanks for being part of our community on the Leadership Hacker podcast. No, thank you very much, Steve. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I want to sign off by saying a thank you to you for joining us on the show too. We recognize without you, there is no show. So please continue to share, subscribe and like and continue to get in touch with us with the great news stories that we share every week. And so that we can continue to bring you great stories, please make sure you give us a five star review where you can and share this podcast with your friends, your teams and your communities. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Leadership Hacker, Leadership Hacker on YouTube and on Instagram the underscore leadership underscore hacker and if that wasn't enough you can also find us on our website leadership-hacker.com tune in to next episode to find out what great hacks and stories are coming your way that's me signing off i'm steve rush and i've been your leadership hacker